watch next. We'll be doing an episode and say, now my iron's too high and we can't get it down. I go into a special doctor. They're doing blood. I have to go to a blood letter. I just bleed over a bucket. Yes. One of these doctors that uses leeches. That's what I'm doing. You know, it's traditional medicine. What our ancestors did. Exactly. Welcome to the My Aloof Vagina podcast, where we explore the distress and surprise of our midlife transitions. We take menopause seriously, but we don't take ourselves seriously. And we believe that learning what to expect in perimenopause can be entertaining. It's inevitable, so we may as well equip ourselves and have a good time. I'm your host, Martha, and I suspect you may be just as puzzled by the shuffle on your particular perimenopause playlist as we are. It can be maddening and sometimes scary. Perimenopause is challenging, like reverse puberty. Hormones surge and fluctuate, and that spurs changes in our bodies. And just when you've gotten a handle on something new, things shift some more, and it can just go away, often while you're treating it. Did fat supplement or lifestyle change or medication fix it? Or was that segment of this journey set to end anyway? Kristen and I had talked about what had been going on, including persistent daily diarrhea, before we recorded this conversation for you. So we start with what it was like revisiting her doctor with that issue still unresolved and with more one-off symptoms that were freaking her out. I just turned 51. So I don't know, 48 or whatever. So that was kind of when some of this stuff started happening for me. But when everything kind of shut down with COVID, I started experiencing heart palpitation. And I have a degree in exercise science. I run EKGs on people all the time for fitness tests. So I kind of knew what was going on, but it also is very scary when it's your own heart. So I first tried using apps on my watch or my phone to try to catch it, to see if it's just a PVC, which is nothing to worry about, blah, blah, blah. What's a PVC? Premature ventricular contraction. Most people have had it happen and they don't know it. Either they don't feel it or it feels like your heart skips a beat, but it happens like once randomly and you don't think anything of it. But for me, it was happening like I would lie down to go to bed and it feels like your heart is beating, 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 pause. Beep, 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 beep. So that's what it feels like. So I called my doctor and I said, it's new. (laughs) Obviously, there's new stress in my world, in everyone's world. But my dad has a history of AFib, which is atrial fibrillation, which is a completely different type of heart palpitations that can actually lead to cardiac arrest and death. So throw that in there. And she was like, yeah, okay, we should get you worked up. So I had an in-person cardiology appointment. Same thing. He was basically like, this is normal, blah, blah, blah. PVC is no big deal. And I said, my dad has AFib. And he said, oh, so got a full workup, had an echo. Everything was fine. But the point is, obviously, I had to kind of advocate for myself, as I'm sure is a common need for all of us to say, "Lo, I no, don't just tell me to take this pill when I feel like I'm an anxious woman. Give me a workup. Make sure there's nothing wrong with my heart. Hello. Yeah. So the pill that she gave you was for anxiety? It's not. It's technically what's called a beta blocker. Oh, yeah. So it just sort of slows down, every slows everything down. But the one she originally gave me was to take as needed. And when I saw the cardiologist, he said, that is totally fine. You can keep taking that. But if you find that this is happening more often, we can also put you on something that you take daily. And then you just would take the smallest dose. And if that helps, then you don't really have to think about it and wait till you're feeling it. So I currently am doing that. I'm taking something every day. And I originally was taking half of the lowest dose and I was doing fine with that. But then there is happening more. I'm going to switch to taking the full lowest dose. So that's what I do. The PVC thing is so interesting to me as you described it, because I had that symptom. They took an EKG and they said, nothing's wrong with your heart. Yeah, it's actually very common. Yeah, but it probably was perimenopause related, but no one said anything to me about it. Heart skipping a beat. It's scary. Totally scary. And because I demanded checking, they did do the EKG, but that didn't find anything. So then they're like, well, you know, what else is going on with you? What can we give you for anxiety? (laughs) But yes, they are. Incredibly common for perimenopausal women, but they're common in general. And the population that I do fitness testing on is firefighters, and they're pretty healthy guys and gals, and they have them a lot. Oh, okay. So they're not unsafe. If somebody's having 10 or 11 per minute in higher stage of a treadmill test, we stop the test just because 
that it's not right and we're not doctors. So mainly you were treated because it was making it hard for you to sleep and distressing. Yeah, basically was because it was upsetting. Yeah, which I think is a reasonable thing to yeah. to deal with. So tell us yeah. on the rest of your saga, then what happened? <laughs> Then what happened? So uh, somewhere along the line, I started being conscious of smelling. Well, it's not natural gas because natural gas doesn't have smell, but the smell they add to natural gas. And at first, because I was always sitting in the same place here at my desk, I thought, oh my gosh, there's a gas leak in my house. And anytime it would happen, I would call everybody in the house and does anybody else smell that? No one else smelled it. No one else even was like, maybe. No, nobody smelled anything. And So it was kind of random. And then over time, it became regular. And then I would realize, like the time for me that I realized, okay, this is not a real thing. Like there's no way there's a gas leak was I was in the hospital with my dad and I was sitting in a hospital room smelling the smell. Yeah, there's no way. So I started really Googling it because I didn't want to call my doctor and be like, I smell gas. (laughs) She was going to be like, did you call the gas company like she's like did you take that anti-anxiety medication <laughs> right. Maybe? right are you crazy yeah so i i didn't really do anything about it other than google it and i had to google pretty deeply to find that just like everything can be a symptom of menopause or perimenopause most of the time it's cigarette smoke when uh-huh. it happens i didn't find any other cases of natural gas but, you know, not everybody writes about their life on the Internet, so you never know. But, of course, the only other things I found were that I probably had a brain tumor. Yeah, so right. <laughs> those were kind of the two options. Uh, so eventually, I just did my annual exam and mentioned it, and she probably raised her shoulders like, eh, eh, okay. I think, you know, I just kind of stunned her, and she didn't really have any yeah. suggestions. I mean, I think she basically, she may have said, like, oh, I don't think it's anything to really worry about, but... It continued and got worse. Then I had my checkup and uh, she was running super late, which she never is. And so she comes running in. This is for my physical. She goes through her list, asks me all the usual things. She's standing up with her hand on the door and says, is there anything else? And I said, "Uh uh-huh. So first of all, and so here's where we go back to what you were alluding to. Your morning constitution was loose every day. Very loose. Yes. Like watery. Sometimes I'd have to go like three or four times for it to be done. But yep. Yeah. So maybe I mentioned it to my mom. I don't know. Uh, But my mom's mom died of colon cancer. Oh. So she was like, maybe mention it to your doctor. So I did. And she was kind of like, okay, let's do a full workup. So thankfully, again, because I had this family history to draw on. So I had lab work and poop lab work. (laughs) Right. Uh, All the good stuff. Super fun. Uh, Of course, I had a colonoscopy. Everything was fine. So that was the first thing I brought up before I let her leave. And she's like, okay, hand on the door again. Anything else? Yes. Uh, Remember last year I told you? You may not remember. I'm still having the gas smell. And sometimes it's really bad. And I actually think I'm going to go crazy. And she's like, okay. So she sat (laughs) back down at her computer and she's like, well, let me get you, you know, a referral to an ENT doctor. Okay. So... Then she's like, okay, was there anything else? And I said, yes. Oh, this would be like a, this could be a scene in a sitcom. Yeah. I was like, could you change your way you're asking me this? Cause clearly it's not working for you. Yeah. And um, I said, I am still having the heart palpitations and I did go up in my medication for them. And she said, okay, but you've had a full workup and you're in contact with the cardiologist, right? I said, yes. And she's like, okay. So I just think with everything that's going on, a lot of these things are probably tied to anxiety. And so we'll just keep an eye on them. Was there anything else? No, I'm good. Thank you. So I left feeling sort of heard and sort of blown off. and But with, with orders for yes. specialists and for workups. Yes. The ENT she sent me to, you know, by the time I got to her, I was kind of like, here's what's going on. Please yeah. don't think I'm crazy. You're like, I'm having these phantom smells where I smell <laughs> the natural gas additive everywhere I go. Like yeah. it's haunting me and no one else smells it. She's that like, make anyone crazy. She's she was great. She immediately was like, you're not crazy. This absolutely happens. Uh, It's a real thing. And there are lots of reasons it could be happening. And so she kind of went through all of them with me. She did not mention brain tumor. Oh, that was helpful. It was nice of her. (laughs) Nice of her, Dr. Google. Yeah. The first thing she said was inflammation from just ongoing allergies, congestion, whatever. 
you could trigger something in one of your sinus passages and it's basically glitching. Um, so she said, that's the first thing. And that's kind of obviously what we hope it is. But let's do a nasal scope. For the first time since I can remember, my my periods aren't regular. Right. So to me, I'm like, finally, I mean, I'm kind of happy about it. I'm like moving forward because I felt like I was in this weird perimenopause limbo where I was having some of the symptoms, but not the main one. It was super regular, 28 days, like yes, textbook. And so then part of me is wondering like, well, wait, maybe I'm actually moving into perimenopause now and these things are resolving. Is there pre-perimenopause? No, but perimenopause is. Now, this is where we get into. Right, exactly. I'm not, I'm not an expert, but I am a perimenopause enthusiast. Yes. And I sort of looked into it because I didn't know I was in it because I didn't recognize the symptoms, which yeah. we discussed before. And my period arrived like clockwork. And so I thought I wasn't even close. Yeah. And all of that perimenopause, all that span of up to 10 years is pre-menopause. And then you have that one day that you have your last period and you don't even know that's when menopause started until right. you don't get one for another year. Yeah. So... So I don't know, like th there was some phase. shift enough in my hormones that it changed some of these other things I'd been experiencing that were related to being pre-menopause. Yeah. And I'll never know. We'll never know. So now I'm considering, should I cut back on that other medication and see if that has resolved? Because I can't yeah. feel it. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm not a doctor. But no, I, I would think that you could stop and see. But I think you can go through different symptoms and shift through. Like I had all those heart palpitations, 45, 46, but I haven't had those PVCs. I feel so cool now. Now you the, know. The name. Yeah. And I know that they're, they're not dangerous, but the PVCs, and that they're so common. I had those PVCs. I have not had phantom smells, but a friend of mine has that phantom smell and had a whole workup. I'm realizing now that she's of the age because she smelled cigarette smoke everywhere. She thought it was her neighbor. I feel like in the world right now, I have it because I smell pot everywhere. Oh, yeah. no, there is pot everywhere. <laughs> yeah, there is. Everywhere. It's true. So it could yeah, be that, through different hormone levels and things change. I think, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, we don't give hormones enough credit. No. Right? And I, it might have been you I was talking to, but I don't remember. I only recently became aware that gynecologists are technically surgeons. That's their training. And we're going to them for our transition support because it makes sense, right. right? That's my lady right. doctor, but that's not their specialty or their training. And, you know, endocrinologists tend to focus on diabetes and thyroid conditions and other endocrine things unless they specialize in menopause. And there just aren't enough doctors specializing in menopause. No. The other thing you and I talked about before was how... We should all be tracking hormones throughout our whole entire lives. That way we would have a better sense of what is normal for us. When is something related to a hormone change and when isn't it? It just would give us a lot more information and it's easy. It's blood test, like add it in there. Yeah, I mean, that I have to fight for tests, even for my thyroid. So I've had a thyroid yeah. condition now for 15 years, I guess. I had it before, but it took me a long time. That's what I was going to tell you about the other day, about the danger of Google, right? You Google this yes. and symptom and it always comes up. But on more than one occasion, because doctors have their hand on the doorknob, right? They're, yep. they're out of time. And because they can't keep up with everything, I self-diagnosed, went in and presented it to my doctor and was correct both times. Of course, there's a thing where you can always think you have a brain tumor or you're going crazy right. or whatever. But there, there is also something to be said for the availability of the information and totally. you know your body. And if you if you're someone who can be a critical thinker and careful researcher and not alarmist, right. you can identify things so that you can kind of start to narrow the focus. I knew I had a thyroid condition. Three physicals in a row, I had gone in and said, I think there's something wrong with my thyroid. And I'd mentioned, first I was exhausted. I was depressed. I was, since we already talked about poop, I was constipated. And I, I didn't have any hair on my eyebrows from like the middle of my eye out. And I had this weird thing where my thumbnails were cracking. So I mentioned that to her and she said, those aren't symptoms. And then she's like, really, you need to eat less and move more. I'm like, okay, all right. I don't think that's what's happening. And then the next year I'd go in and every time she said your thyroid hormone was normal. So by then I'd Googled like crazy. And I said, I yeah. think I have this thing. I kind of played dumb. I said, 
actually, I lied and said that my aunt has this thing with her thyroid. It's kind of like sounds Japanese. She's like Hashimoto. And I said, oh, yeah. Like, I didn't know. Like, I had not right. studied the shit exactly. out of it. And she's like, oh. I said, so my antibodies tested. She said, oh, well, your insurance isn't going to cover that. I said, well, I'll pay for it. I, I yeah. want to know. And sure enough, she called me the next week and said, hey, you do have that Hashimoto's, but your TSH is still high. I said, okay. She's like, so we can't really treat it. And I said, what do you mean? Is you are still, your TSH is still in range. Right. And I said, well, what do you do? She's like, oh, you know, it kind of, your body attacks your thyroid and attacks your thyroid. And eventually it'll totally poop out. <laughs> this is in 2006. And then we'll start giving you thyroid replacement. And I said, I'm 36 years old. I want a second opinion. <laughs> Yeah. So I went to an endocrinologist and, and then have been treated for Hashimoto's ever since. And yeah. letting it kill your thyroid is not... Yeah, that sounds like a really bad plan. The solution. They have no way to reverse it, right? Or at the time, yeah. traditional doctors didn't. So that was one case where I basically had to lie to a doctor to get yeah. the test I wanted. But we can't expect like my GP to know about <clears throat> Hashimoto's and the proper treatment. Right. Well, that's, yeah. And that's who I've seen, my GP. And thankfully, she's referred me when she felt like she wasn't sure about something. And like you said, in general, my doctor is very good, but there are just certain things that, you know, like, just take this seriously. Yeah. And I think we did talk about this an another time. Just the idea that I understand they don't want to medicalize something that's a natural stage of life. And if having phantom smells is part of that, they don't want to pathologize it and make it an illness because every illness has a code and they have a protocol and the code for the billing. And so if they mark it as an illness, they have to deal with it in that way. This yeah. is where it all gets complicated too by the health system and exactly. the insurance yes. system, right? And this is why I've sought care outside of, yeah. it's still a Western, my doctor's still a Western doctor, but it's outside the insurance system and she specializes in healthy aging, right? That's her focus. But if there was some way to help us navigate it with either the the research, they could say, yeah, this is crazy, but this is a list of 150 things that women have recently complained about in menopause and have confirmed are related to their hormones yeah. or something. I don't even know how they would do it. That's why this podcast even exists, because it, how do you find out? Right? Yeah. How do you make this a systemized thing that every woman has access to? Right. Because you and I probably could have access to specialists and things like that that we can pay for, but everybody can't. And depending where you live, being in Southern California... I have tons of options. If I lived somewhere in the in rural areas, yeah, I'm stuck with Doctor Google. <laughs> yeah, and here's the other thing about it, and we have talked about this before. My path into this kind of aging care was on a hunt for testosterone supplementation. Right. That's what I wanted. That's what I was going for because of that clitoral atrophy, alarming thing. And would I have taken a different path? Would things be different, maybe even a positive way, mm -hmm. if I hadn't gone and found, I knew what I wanted through Dr. Google and podcasts and books and things. And she tested me and everything was fine otherwise. And she gave it to me. And now I see her and focus on HRT. But if I hadn't had to self-diagnose, I probably would not have gone to my doctor and said, hey, listen, I have a new boyfriend and it's been a while since I've had sex. And you know, I'm not having as many orgasms during intercourse as I'd like. So what do you recommend? Like I probably wouldn't have gone to a traditional right. doctor anyway. So it's not even worth retreading it. But I'm on a very specific path in this paradigm of care that even believing in it, I'm talking to enough people on different paths to know that there's a whole different way to navigate it. And yeah. this is not necessarily the right way, but there wasn't some place else to get support right. on it. I yeah. had to go to, to a doctor who's awesome and kind of kooky. In the good way. My mom, while I was growing up, always had migraines yeah. and started going to all kinds of doctors and called them her quacks. Yeah. I'm going to see one of my quacks today, but the quacks helped her. Like The quacks have time. They listen. Yeah. They're open-minded enough and still searching that they're... Well, they're not bound. Right. Also. They don't have the same restrictions. They don't have the insurance restrictions. When you go in there, you know that you know your insurance is not going to cover what they prescribe for you necessarily. Yeah. So... If they find something that's a little bit weird or off-label, they just prescribe it, yeah. you know? Every time I go there, the conversation involves an additional supplement. And she's not even like some of my friends who go to functional doctors and that's insane. Like they talk about food sensitivities and, and my friends go down yeah. these rabbit holes of testing and, and all of a sudden they're sick people. So she's not even there. 
but she has me on vitamin D, which I'm glad. And I should be on yeah. vitamin D. And now there are different things. She's like, oh, you should take this, maybe try this. And then I listen and I go and I Google and I try to find things. And then I decide if I'm really going to take it. But she also cares about nutrition and she cares that I'm controlling my blood sugar and she cares about fitness. Well, it all and goes together. It's very holistic. And I, yes. I like that too. So she has time to talk to me. It costs a lot of money, but she's not just giving me pills. Um, Taking isolated situations and giving you right, pills. Like right. it's a big picture. Like vitamin D is not, no. you know, I mean, that's a big picture supplement that most yeah. people need. Yeah, but no one had bothered. I had some, now I feel like I'm just like, it's like our medical conversation, but I know I had always had lower iron and she's the first one who focused on it long enough with me and gave me alternatives so that I could take the blood yeah. builder. And I've been on it for a long time. I've never lasted on any of the irons they gave me because of the side yeah. effects, right? I take the raw iron. I don't even know what this is. It probably is the same thing, but it's like vegetable based with mm -hmm. beets and stuff like that. And it's resolved it. I don't have any kind of anemia anymore, but yeah. no one else has ever bothered or had the time or probably the luxury of focusing on it in the way that she does and then asking me and checking. Yeah, I take a lot of things, you know, yeah, me too. but it's mostly my own research, but also some of it's from her. Like since I'm vegetarian, I'm not vegan, but she always checks my B12s and yeah. has me on a B12 supplement. She's like, I'd rather you just take it. Vitamin D, she did recommend years ago. She started testing it. And so I do do those types of, but yeah, it's a lot of it's just, you wonder sometimes you're like, I don't know. I just Who knows? Epiphany. Who really knows? Right. I said it's epiphany though. Maybe I'm finally not anemic because I'm finally not menstruating as much. Yeah, that could be too. <laughs> and I'm giving her all this credit. Because I take this raw iron, which is not, I, there is something, there's a product called Blood Builder. That's what um, I take. Yeah, for whatever but reason. B12 and all that. It's a combination. Yeah, I don't know. Probably, this was probably Dr. Amazon research I was doing. But the raw iron I take, it doesn't bother my stomach because that's always been an issue, like constipation and all that with iron supplements. I'm going to find an iron that I can tolerate that seems to help. Mine's been higher too. So I do think... I mean, it could be both, Martha. Yeah. <laughs> I just saying. have never stuck to it long enough. Because, yeah. To know. Yeah. You know, because it, it always makes me feel sick. That makes sense. I just was like, oh, yeah. It could be that. There's that too. Huh. Yeah. That's the change. Watch. Next, I'll be, we'll be doing an episode and say, now my iron's too high and we can't get it down. I'm going to a special doctor to, they're doing blood I have to go to a blood letter. I just bleed over a bucket. Yes. One of these doctors that uses leeches. That's Yes. You know, it's traditional medicine. We have to respect <laughs> what our ancestors did to get out my humors. We got to clear the humors. Yes. Well, our, oh, now I can't think of the word. What, what did we, how they used to describe women of our age. Oh, hysterics? Hysteria. Yeah. It's our hysteria. Yes. Yeah. So right now everything is resolved. I don't know about the heart thing because I haven't oh, gone off yeah. the meds. Right. Uh, but I've been just, that's something I just started thinking about the last couple of weeks was because the whole change in my cycle or cycle being all over the place. Yeah. There is definitely a hormonal change that has happened that maybe right. why these things are resolving as well. And I mean, I guess I'll take it, but maybe new things will happen. So we'll have an update. So what symptoms now? We can liken it to reverse puberty mm -hmm. in the sense that puberty doesn't happen all in one day. It's, it's yeah. what happens over time with those introduced and the different levels being introduced. So it makes sense to me that how we experience it will change over sure. the period of time. Yeah. The other thing, you know, was interesting because once I started thinking that these things were related to my cycle, Month after month, I would be like, what is wrong with me? And then I'd look at my calendars for the following week and I'd be like, oh. And I would find that during that week, I would have more heartburn. I had more roof of mouth pain. What? Yeah, Google it. With, with the word perimenopause? Of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I'm really honest with myself and you and our one listener who's in the car and her husband's like, I thought this was going to be about vaginas <laughs> in a different way. <laughs> well, my real goal is to go through this and be healthy, like avoiding sarcopenia, right? Avoiding right. muscle wasting. I have my eye on maintaining my weight. I'm not trying to lose weight anymore. Right. Like I'm at the point where I'm like, I don't want to be a frail old lady. Right. I want to be as strong as possible as long as I can and maintaining my heart health mm -hmm. and all of these different things and blood sugar. So if I do those things, if we do those things and focus on them and lucky enough not to get ill or sick, Right. or have an accident, then it doesn't have to look like it used to. Right. I don't have to look like, my, <laughs> they're still alive, but they're not listening to this. Because I said, <laughs> pussy, 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 vagina, pussy, and they'll turn it off. But I mean, right? Like my mom is super frail for her yeah. age. It's ridiculous how much she has wasted in just the last 10 years. And I look at it and I think, well, she's only 20 years older than me. So, 
am I 10 years away from starting to lose all my muscle mass and so, tottering and losing my balance, right? How am I going to live my life differently? What am I going to do to make sure yeah. now that I have the health foundation that I can navigate this and be healthier than what I'm observing in the people ahead of me? My mom is 76, I believe. And we just had this conversation. She's like, Kristen, all of my friends are these frail old ladies. She is my role model for health and fitness. She's very active. She lifts weights. She walks a lot. And she's not frail. She's not frail at all. I should have your mom on or you should go interview her and so you can come back with like tips on how to not be a frail 76-year-old. You know what? This is where your doctor's right. Eat less and move more. <laughs> Yeah. That's going to be her secret. I'll tell you, it's it's that she has always eaten really well. Not crazy. She she enjoys her wine. She enjoys dessert, but not a lot. She at least goes for a walk every day and she does weight training or cardio or something at least four, if not five times a week. She's been that way her whole life. So yeah, that's the advice. Well, there's, we're talking about so many things. Yes. We've covered a lot of ground. Yeah. <laughs> or we at least traipsed over it. I don't know we if we did. covered it. We, we visited it. <laughs> Yes. And it all, it didn't even all start with poop. No. But we got there. Mm -hmm. Poop and vaginas. I definitely want to think about the ways we can navigate the health system to get the support that we need. Absolutely. It feels like such a revolution that I am more inclined to start looking for resources. We, you know, obviously med schools to get on board and the newer generation of doctors and, and care providers of all types to realize the potential for this. If you want to just make it even commercial, this market for a lot of women, of the age that are going through menopause, they're comfortable. They have insurance, they have what they need, but they can't find the right providers. So yeah, I don't know. There's so many layers of what needs to or could happen to help. Totally. And I think the solutions, they're probably market driven. Exactly. Instead of, and there are already you know, so many healthcare. products, so many and so many but, things. The anti-aging market from a wellness perspective is so huge. Right. It just feels like that's where it's going to come from. It's just challenging because so many of the things that we experience if someone could say, oh, actually, that's normal. Right. We're not going to give you a drug for it. But just so you know, this is normal. You could try some meditation or, you know, definitely hydrate more, but you're not crazy. Right. This happens. Even that would be an improvement. Even if it's just the, the bedside manner. Whatever 100%. that means. Yeah. But yeah. I would love to have that for these other symptoms that we're experiencing well, yeah. with perimenopause. Absolutely. I mean, instead of either blowing it off or saying might be anxiety, which of course it could be, we all have it. Maybe just say, wow, that is, you're right on schedule. Perfect. These unexplained symptoms are not illnesses. We can't really treat them, but they're real. And I'm yeah. sorry, you're uncomfortable. You're going to feel self-conscious because I'm basically saying it's in your head, but in your head still is real. Yeah. That's still a place. That's yeah. still a legit thing that we need to take care of. Just because it's in your head doesn't mean, doesn't have the potential to be really disruptive to your life. So I think we should end on that. Just because it's in your head doesn't mean it doesn't have the potential to be really disruptive in your life. There are a lot of symptoms and things we experience that are not illness, but are disruptive. Absolutely. Just because it's a natural state, just because every woman goes through it, doesn't mean the things that are happening during aren't important. Thank you for listening. Take care of yourself and take care of your vagina. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend you think would enjoy it too. And one of the surprises of the show has been how great it is to hear from you. Remember to find me the next time you're on Instagram to let me know what you think. Look me up at Maya Vagina.